Europe's medieval period, what historians used to call the Dark Ages, ended in the 15th century, after the disaster of the Black Death. But even before the bubonic plague arrived, harsh winters and rainy summers beginning around 1310 had caused widespread famine. Feudal lords continued squeezing their peasants and the states continued raising taxes. So several million people died during this famine. And then of course, up to two thirds of Europe's population disappeared between the plague's arrival in 1347 and its eventual decline in 1353. This depopulation threatened the power of the nobility and the church as surviving peasants became less patient with the taxes and the labor demands of bishops and lords. Peasant revolts in France and England in the second half of the 14th century showed that the feudal system of the Middle Ages was beginning to come to an end. Unlike the new Eastern Muslim empires and the ongoing Chinese empire, Europe was really unable to reunify itself under a single leader and to create its own empire. Although Austria's Habsburg dynasty did its best to lead an alliance, which it optimistically called the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. The joke about the Holy Roman Empire that I learned when I was a student was that it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. Too many languages and local centers of power competed for dominance. And the Catholic Church, which was and probably still is Europe's largest landowner, was unable really to exercise the same type of secular power as they did spiritual power. Instead, the church found itself pulled into regional contests for power. And one example of this is that in 1309, a French-born pope decided to move his residence from Rome to Avignon. Seven popes then resided in France and increasingly fell under the control of the French king until 1378, when another French-born pope decided he was going to move back to Rome. But the French rulers and a growing class of aristocratic French cardinals were unwilling to give up the power that came with having their own pope. So for another 60 years, there were two competing papal courts, one in Rome and a rival in Avignon. Although the Avignon popes have been called anti-popes, it's important to understand that the conflict was primarily about political power rather than about theology or religious doctrine. They weren't anti-popes because they were anti-Catholicism or anything like that. However, theological conflicts, of course, were right around the corner. The arrival of the printing press in Europe in the middle of the 15th century allowed critics of the church, like the friar Martin Luther, to begin publishing books and pamphlets calling for reform. Printing, you'll recall, was a Chinese invention, but it was improved by Johannes Gutenberg, a German goldsmith who understood that movable type was much more valuable and useful in an alphabetic-based language than it had been in a character-based language like Chinese, where you have to have thousands of woodblocks for the different characters. In a Latin alphabet, you only needed 26 or so pieces of type that could be mixed and matched. Printing spread classical Greek and Roman texts, many of which had been carried to Europe by those refugees from Constantinople, and helped to ignite what we call the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth in Europe. A new philosophy called humanism focused scholars on learning that wasn't necessarily contained in scripture or in church-approved sources. And then later on skepticism toward those church-approved sources and the beginnings of disobedience of the decrees of religious authorities. Some Renaissance geniuses like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo didn't directly challenge the claims of political and religious authorities. Their humanism was generally about a greater focus on the human form and putting humans at the center of art. But others like Machiavelli and Galileo did. And then the discovery of the Americas, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter, also upset the traditional understanding of the world's origin and its history, because of course the religious texts didn't account 
for the existence of the Americas or the people on them. And then, as I said, religious reformers like Martin Luther use this ability to print books to radically change the way Europeans thought about their religion and about the Catholic Church. So before I talk more about Luther, a couple of questions for you. First, do you think the existence of the church in Europe was a significant factor in preventing an empire from actually forming? And second, how did the spread of new knowledge encourage this humanism and skepticism? 